I myself was working with sailors' wives from the three ships that sank, Abuka, Cressy, Hogue, and it was pitiful to see them. If anyone had a letter from France, we just read it, and we got to know all, all the, the, the girls, the sweethearts or, or husbands, we got to know all their Christian names. And we were, when we used to go into the factory in the morning, how's Tommy, how's Dick, how's so have you heard from him? And of course, some would shed a tear and say they hadn't, which meant what, you know, what had happened to them. Wages were good, and some of the public resented this. They thought the girls in munitions were getting above themselves, for getting their place. We as munition workers were heartily disliked by the general public. You would go down the street, and people would look at you and say, huh, one of those munition workers. Anything derogatory that could be said about you was said about you. It was very uncomfortable sometimes. And um, I think, as a general rule, the idea was that you made such enormous amounts of money and other people didn't. The most dangerous work of all was filling the shelves with explosive or making the explosive itself. The clothing we wore was fireproof, the shoes were fireproof and every time we went out to a meal we had to take all our, out, our fireproof clothing off and put on our outdoor clothing which took time from our dinner hour and again, we were searched when we returned in case of um, cigarettes, matches, or pins, etc. Once or twice we heard, oh, so-and-so's gone. Perhaps she'd made a mistake and her eye was out. But there wasn't any big explosion all the time I was there. We sang. We made the little pellets, very innocent-looking little pellets. But had there been the slightest grit in those pellets, goodbye. We got home and we had a lovely good wash. And believe me, the water was blood red and our skin from then on was perfectly yellow. Right down through the body, legs and toes and toenails even, perfectly yellow. These women were called canaries. Their devotion was essential to the success of Lloyd George's armaments program. Through no fault of their own, they were also the cause of one of Lloyd George's toughest problems in 1915. The men, the trade unions, saw them as a threat. A threat to privileges built up painfully over decades and jealously guarded. Unskilled women working machines were a threat to traditional craft skills and methods. They were a threat to the future livelihood of men bargaining with employers Employers who could make huge profits out of the war. The trade unions fought hard against the introduction of unskilled workers. Dilution, it was called. Resolved that we refuse to entertain the proposal to allow the introduction of semi-skilled workers on work now done by fully qualified mechanics. Resolved that no woman shall be put to work a lathe and if this is done, the men will know how to protect their rights. Each month of 1915, the number of strikes rose, from 47 in February to 63 in May. The disputes over dilution took place against a history of a hundred years of bitter industrial struggle. For the first time, the trade unions no longer represented the underdog. Now there was full employment. The workers were essential to the national effort. For the first time, cabinet ministers sat down to negotiate as equals with trade unionists. It was yet another revolution. It took a firm government promise that pre-war methods would be restored at the peace, together with an act of parliament controlling the whole field of arms production, including the booming profits, before the trade unions accepted dilution. To Lloyd George, drink was another enemy insidiously undermining his campaign for higher production. Beer could be bought in public houses which stayed open all day. Was this not a peril to efficiency? Was it not a cause of absenteeism? A new war regulation limited opening hours, and so the British pattern of life was changed in yet another way by the need for shells and guns. A slow business, a hard task, 
to uproot the habits of a nation steeped in tradition, over-affectionate towards old customs. Yet the king himself, symbol of one of Britain's most revered traditions, helped the change forward. He toured the industrial areas without fuss or pomp to persuade the workers that they too were performing national service. Without an adequate supply of shells, we cannot hope to win, he told them. As an example of self-denial, he signed the pledge and alcohol vanished from the royal household. He visited the wounded in hospital and the homes of their families. The king spared no effort to bind the monarchy and people together by shared experience. But the impatient war was clamorous with needs, and soldiers paid with their lives when design or manufacture faltered. The money was raised by five shillings a week for everybody, and then they introduced a bonus system. You filled so many shells, and after that amount had been filled, you got a bonus for how many more you filled. This was a very bad thing, really because it led to carelessness. People were not careful. The shells would come back to us as either too heavy or too light. And, and that was, of course, a very bad thing because they might fall short when they were fired. At present, our high explosive for 18 pounders is so unreliable that we cannot use it in large quantities. We have lost 36 guns in a month by premature explosions. This represents the highest percentage of bursts ever suffered by any artillery on both sides in this war. Even by the end of the year, most of the shells issued to the troops were the result of orders placed under the war office system which Lloyd George had so attacked. A third of them came from American and Canadian factories. Not until 1916 could Lloyd George's colossal program produce war material in overflowing abundance. Nevertheless, the British were rousing themselves, flexing their dormant muscles. Civilians and soldiers, industrial as well as military might, the Allies were moving into total war. <laughs> 